I am Tony Valenzuela, the executive director of One Archives Foundation. Um, I have been in this position for a little less than a year, um, but One Archives Foundation is this storied organization here in Los Angeles, founded in 1952, believe it or not, making it the oldest active LGBTQ organization in the country. Um, we have had many iterations, and we're going to be talking about some of this um, with this presentation, which Trevor is leading and that I'm supporting. Um, but um, one of the things that folks know about the archive is its collection that is um, at USC. One Archives Foundation gifted that collection. It's the largest um, uh, collection of LGBTQ materials in the world um, housed there at USC. And um, today, the organization, One Archives Foundation, uh, works to spotlight that collection at USC, as well as to do public programs and exhibitions and arts and cultural events, all with a through line of queer and trans history. So we're delighted to be here with you tonight to talk about um, some of LA's queer history, some of this movement's queer history. Um, and um, so now I'm going to pass it to Trevor. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy Pride Month. My name is Trevor. I am the Education Manager at One Archives. Um, I am recently uh, at, on, at the One Archives. I joined in April. Uh, and prior to that, I was a high school history teacher. Um, so I am a credentialed uh, history educator in California. Um, I'm very passionate about queer history and marginalized histories. Um, I'm also a drag performer, so uh, Pride has been a busy time for me. Um, and I'm excited to be here with all of you today to share uh, to share some of these histories. Um, and we're primarily going to be focusing on the 1940s to the present, um, but queer history um, is as old as history itself. So we could talk about many things, um, but we do not have that time today. All right. Um, I'll just, just yeah, want to quick jump in and just let everyone know we will have a, a Q&A session at the end. So if folks have, have questions, they can um, ask them, use the... Uh, Q&A feature there on Zoom. Um, and I know you mentioned too, if there are any sort of quick clarification points too, people can can chime in there as well. Right, yeah, anything anything sort of clarifying, happy to answer throughout the presentation. If it's more of a discussion or probing question, uh, we can save that one for, for the end. We'll have time for that. Um, and before we get sort of into this history today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about language. Obviously, language, the way we describe things changes over time. That's particularly true for um, our community. Um, so you can see sort of a timeline of dates here um, of when uh, we started to use these terms in the LGBTQIA um, acronym to describe um, people of diverse gender expressions and sexual orientations. Um, and uh, there are some words that we no longer use um, to describe uh, queer people. Even the term queer itself um, was once a derogatory term and now has been embraced by um, many people in the community to describe our community at large, uh, though there are still some people who may be uncomfortable with that term in itself. Um, and in particular, I wanna draw attention to the words um, transsexual and transvestite. Um, those words were sort of invented in the 1920s and applied to people who sort of transgress gender boundaries. Um, we no longer use those terms to describe people who we would now describe as transgender, uh, someone whose gender identity is different than what it was assigned at birth. Um, however, uh, as we talked about this history, for example, in the 1960s um, and 1970s, there was a group called the Treat Transvestite Action Revolutionary. Uh, that was a term that trans people themselves used to describe their identity at that time. Um, but really, since the 1990s, um, we no longer use those terms, and we use the term transgender. Um, so really, I wanted to point that out. Um, many of these terms we still do use in our community, in our acronym, um, to identify ourselves um, to the outside world. Um, 
Great. So um, as both a uh, land acknowledgement and a bit of, um, uh, of an example of how queer history does go back thousands of years, I want to say that we are in the presence of traditional and unceded territory of the Tongva's people. Uh, Tongva Nation has been in the LA Basin area for over 7,000 years. Before Spanish colonizers arrived, um, indigenous folks such as the Tongva had expansive understanding of genders, sexualities, relationships, and marriages. Uh, the Mojave believed that biological females, um, they called Guami, who took on masculine dress and roles, had always existed. There were They were patriarchs of families and before colonization, may have served as tribal leaders, uh, a role reserved for men. Missionaries separated same-sex couples and imposed cruel punishments, such as publicly stripping a biological male in women's clothing and forcing them to do labor. The term two-spirit was coined by Elder Myra Laramie of the Fisher River Creed Nation at a conference for queer Native Americans in 1990. Great, and that's actually a photo of Elder Myra Laramie um, in the top right of this photo. Um, and a two-spirit um, AIDS, AIDS resource um, that's actually from our archive there in the middle. Um, so we're fast forwarding a lot in time <laughs> to the 1940s, which is really when we see the growth of queer communities in Los Angeles catalyzed by World War II. Um, so World War II uh, creates wi widespread social and economic changes. Um, changes sort of opportunities around gender. You have concentrated communities of men and concentrated communities of uh, women. Um, and as people return from war, um, they are able to move away from home um, to the city, particularly port cities like Los Angeles, where they're coming in, um, and create these new um, communities through bars, through beaches, through public spaces um, that didn't exist uh, prior to this time um, in the same, uh, ex to the same extent. Um, so in 19, uh, and actually there's a history that we've been working on through the One Archives Foundation on Ginger Rogers Beach, um, which is the gay section of Will Rogers Beach, uh, which really was an important site for um, war migrants and people who are taking advantage of this new uh, these new communities post World War II. Um, so beginning in the 1940s, Will Rogers State Beach became a place where uh, queer people could express uh, sort of relationships and gender expression in ways that they were not able to do before. Um, in the next slide, Tony's going to talk about the Mattachine Society, um, but before the Mattachine Society was even formed, two of its founders, Harry Hay and Rudy Geinrich, um, went to um, the beach in Santa Monica to gather petitions for an anti-war petition, and they were actually unable to find any fellow gay people who would agree to be part of a homosexual organization. Um, so actually this month, um, we are commemorating the history of Ginger Rogers Beach, uh, and you'll find signs there at the beach um, telling this history. So um, the first sustained gay activist organization did not coalesce until 1951, when Harry Hay led the formation of the Mattachine Society in Los Angeles. The Mattachine Society um, was important because it blamed society, not other queer people, for the discrimination they faced, um, which they countered um, the internalized shame and guilt uh, felt by many gay and lesbian people. Hay argued that gay and lesbian people were a minority group oppressed in society and that they needed to organize. So membership in the organization grew slowly, though. Most gay and lesbian people believed quiet assimilation to be the best option and would not risk exposure for what they viewed as an impossible cause at the time. In 1952, when the society successfully defended a police entrapment case against one of its founders named Dale Jennings, membership rapidly expanded and there were Mattachine Society chapters 
formed all across the country. Um, however, in 1953, Mattachine Society members succumbed to the Red Scare of the era, era and forced out Hay and other original founders because of their past ties to the Communist Party. Um, meanwhile, in 1955, eight lesbians in San Francisco, led by Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, joined together to found the Daughters of Belitis. This was the first lesbian organization in the United States. Um, the organization worked to provide a national support group for the often isolating lives of lesbians in that era. Um, the Daughter of Belitis in 1956 created an important publication called The Ladder, which Phyllis Lyon edited for the next 14 years. Black lesbian activist Ernestine Eckstein was featured on the cover in June 1966. Um, the organization expanded to several chapters across the United States, each with varying levels of activist involvement. Um, the Daughters hosted an educational conference in, in San Francisco with one incorporated, one Inc. in the late 1950s. One Inc. is one Archives Foundation's original name. Um, one Magazine, which was born out of this organization, was first published in January 1953. We're celebrating 70 years. It was the first widely distributed magazine for homosexuals. The magazine featured editorials, short stories, book reviews, and letters to the editor, and it was published until 1967, which incidentally is when The Advocate began its run to the present day. So print, uh, so print media played and print publications played a really important role in building sort of a national uh, unity and identity with in uh, among gays and lesbians and queer people. Um, and the government is sort of taking notice of this. There's a federal obscenity law uh, that bans the dissemination of lewd or obscene materials. Um, and in 1954, um, the LA Postal Authority sees the August and October editions of one magazine under this law. Um, so after four years um, of litigation, one takes this case to the Supreme Court. They say our First Amendment rights are being violated. Um, there was not anything sort of pornographic in the magazine, it's simply um, discussions of homosexual identity um, and uh, homosexual love. Um, and the case actually makes it all the way to the Supreme Court in 1958. And the court decides that um, sides with one ink says their First Amendment rights were violated and essentially um, makes a landmark the decision that allows the dissemination of uh, LGBTQ materials across the country. Um, and this is actually the first Supreme Court case um, that is dealing with LGBTQ rights in the United States. Um, and this is a picture here of uh, Eric Jolber, um, an attorney, the attorney who argued the case, um, who is actually, uh, he was a straight man from Santa Monica. Um, I believe he, he's featured in a podcast that we have coming out also um, in the next month um, about different queer publications and the impact they had within the community. Yeah, and I'll also mention that in the fall, if you keep up, like join our newsletter, we're going to do a special program in the fall um, in October on Eric um, and have um, some original family members here to talk about um, him um, and his significance, which a lot of people don't realize, um, even gay people. So what's important about one um, history is that, um, you know, we were talking about how one was formed. It actually was formed, uh, but there were some folks who broke off from Manachine. They've started One Inc. in order to publish one magazine. Um, and so since 52, um, One Inc. published this magazine, and then they um, formed something called the One Institute for Homophile Studies. This was the educational arm of One Inc. It was um, Jim Kepner, Dorleg, and uh, Dr. Thomas Merritt um, who founded the Institute in 56, and it conducted seminars and published a journal. 
um, the one institute advocated and educated, eventually issuing masters, the first institution to issue, issue advanced degrees in homophile studies starting in 1981. The photo here that you see here is a lecture in 1978 with Dr. Evelyn Hooker, who was instrumental in removing homosexuality from the DSM-3. Right. And I also want to point out the photo on the right is from the 1980s, um, I believe 1985, uh, in a Pride March in Los Angeles. That's the Community Youth and Education Project, which was a group for young people under the age of 23 that existed within the One Institute. Um, so these are students who uh, sort of came to the One Institute for questions about family support, identity, but also to study queer history um, and to do public programs for the community, which we continue to do today um, through the One Archives Foundation. Um, Someone within sort of the broader uh, movement at this time that I wanted to talk about, um, and I found this photo of Bayard Rustin in our archive, so it really gave me um, a reason to incorporate him to this presentation. Um, but Rustin was an openly gay Quaker pacifist uh, who was an extremely important, influential civil rights activist, um, especially in the 1950s and, and 60s. Um, so he played a key role in sort of in, uh, teaching Martin Luther King Jr. about Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence. With King, he formed the Southern Christian Leadership Council. Um, and in 1953, he gave a lecture on world peace in Pasadena. Um, after that lecture in Pasadena, um, he was found having sex with two men in a parked car. He pleaded guilty to the crime of sex perversion and was sentenced to 60 days in jail. This had a huge impact on his role in uh, the civil rights movement. and. Um, often kept him behind the scenes at demonstrations. So although he was doing a lot of the work and masterminding behind um, the uh, behind the civil rights movement, he was sort of kept out of the public because of his homosexuality. Um, he was the sort of lead organizer of the March on Washington in 1963, where Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Um, and on that same evening, um, he was called a communist draft dodger and pervert on the floor of the US Senate. Um, so this, this caused many civil rights organizations at the time to sort of force him out. Um, he continued to be an activist, particularly speaking out against economic inequality. And in 1985, two years before his death, um, he spoke at a conference in Los Angeles for Black and White Men Together. Uh, which was an organization um, that brought together Black and white gay men to fight against racism and homophobia. They particularly played a big role in throughout the uh, AIDS crisis. Um, and in 19, and sorry, in 2013, Rustin was, uh, was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack Obama. Um, and he, uh, now he's sort of getting the recognition that he should have always gotten for his contributions. So, um, you know, Pride Month is a commemoration of the Stonewall Riots. Um, you know, a year after the Stonewall Riots, um, folks started to march in New York City um, and in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago, and this be became pride. But it's important to remember in um, queer history that uprisings happened before Stonewall, and some of those uh, most important ones were here on the West Coast, including Los Angeles. This first, so Cooperage Donuts uprising from May 1959, I do want to point out that just um, a few days ago, there was a story in the New York Times sort of contesting some of the facts about Cooper Donuts uprising, even the fact that it happened at this donut shop called Cooper's Donuts. Um, but as we all know, and all of you probably know about um, the way that um, we study history and the way that accounts of history evolve, um, this could be one of those examples. But 
legend has it that um, one of the first LGBTQ uprisings against police harassment in modern U.S. history uh, was at this 24-hour cafe, which was in downtown LA, situated between two gay bars um, with predominantly Black and Latinx patrons, um, where uh, Cooper, uh, patrons of Cooper's insist, or keep the patrons of Cooper's consisted of street hustlers, gays and lesbians, drag queens, and transgender folks. So when two police officers began to randomly arrest drag queens and transgender folks, others there revolted um, to their peers' treatments and started throwing donuts and coffee and other items at the cops, forcing them to retreat and shutting down Main Street for an entire day. Um, some other examples of these uprisings were um, the Compton's cafeteria riots in uh, San Francisco in August 1966. Compton's was a 24-hour restaurant. It was one of the few places that didn't openly discriminate against queer people. Um, transgender women, tran uh, transgender women were often arrested for female impersonation and obstructing the sidewalk. In August 1966, when the restaurant management requested police remove queer patrons from the restaurant, more than 100 transgender and queer folks smashed police cars and windows and brawled with police officers. Um, so these are two important early uprisings prior to Stonewall. And then um, the this next slide where I'm pride is pride. Uh, so pride here stands for personal rights and defense and education. It was an organized activist front, um, an organized activist front in Los Angeles didn't coalesce until seven years after these other uprisings when Steve Ginsburg founded Pride uh, to promote pride in the gay community and instigate a more radical response than the Mattachine or Daughters of Belitis. So Jim Kepner of One was the community services coordinator in 67. Um, pride led one of the largest LGBT protests to date in response to the police raids of the Black Cat Tavern in Los Angeles, which many of you know is in Silver Lake. Um, during the raid, police brutally beat and arrested patrons and bar employees. One of the most enduring legacies of Pride's activism was their eponymous newsletter, Pride, which would evolve into the first national gay news publication, The Advocate. Great. And around this time, shortly after uh, the Black Cat raids, um, oh, one second, um, we uh, see sort of more uh, police targeting of a female impersonation of cross-dressing throughout. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Seems throughout. to be okay. Throughout Los Angeles. Um, and one of the people who was sort of a leader in this fight uh, was Sir Lady Java, um, who was a Black transgender activist that was born in New Orleans. Um, in her early 20s, she moved to Los Angeles where she worked as a waitress and a female impersonator at the Red Fox Club. Um, and at this time, there's a city of Los Angeles ordinance named rule uh, number nine that was passed in the mid 1800s, um, which made it illegal to quote, impersonate by means of costume or dress a person of the opposite sex uh, without a permit from the LA Board of Police Commissioners. Um, so this, uh, this ordinance was used to often target uh, cross-dressing performers or transgender uh, women. And this resulted in shutdowns of social gatherings and events. Um, in partnership with the ACLU, Java took the ordinance to court in 1969, but the court found that she was not able to sue because uh, the bar itself or the nightclub itself had to sue. So a club owner then took the case to the courts, and it was successfully repealed, which effectively legalized cross-dressing and drag performances in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and actually, we sort of see similar laws to this being passed now um, throughout the United States. Um, in particular, Tennessee was most recently the first state to pass a new anti um public cross-dressing law in decades. Um, so I find this particularly relevant to, uh, to today. 
So one of the most important and consequential actions um, in the early sort of modern gay rights movement was what we call the Biltmore invasion. And so since the first publication in the 1950s of the DSM, which many of you know is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, since the 1950s, the, the DSM classified homosexuality as a mental illness. So the American uh, Psychiatric Association designation of homosexuality as a mental illness led to efforts to find a cure. And those ranged from conversion therapy to electroshock therapy. Um, those sentenced to mental institutions often faced even more extreme measures um, like lobotomies and castration. In 1957, Evelyn Hooker, who we just saw a picture of um, doing a presentation at one institute, she had published a research paper, The Adjustment of the Male Overt Homosexual, which postulated that homosexuality was not actually an illness, but a variant in sexual pattern with the normal range, within the normal range of human behavior. So therefore, by the late 60s, radical activists had taken up the fight and were coordinating zaps and protests at APA meetings and against prominent psychiatrists and psychologists across the United States. Since the 1920s, the Biltmore Hotel was a popular hangout spot um, in Los Angeles for gay men and became an important space of community and camaraderie. In fact, um, oh, some of the those one institute, uh, um, they would there would be the, these one institute um, midwinter seminars that would happen at the Biltmore. Um, so in 1970, the APA was hosted a behavioral modification conference at the Biltmore and was presenting on the use of electroshock therapy to cure homosexuality. It was then that the Gay Liberation Front invaded the event and led to a protest of about 30 people. They were outraged by the language and labeling used by psychologists. Um, outraged by that language, gay and lesbian psychologists started the Association of Gay Psychologists. In 1973, Dr. Roberts Bitzer, a member of the American Psychiatric Association's task force, um, prepared a paper stating that homosexuality itself does not meet the criteria to be considered a psychiatric disorder. The combination of the protests and this behind the scenes negotiations culminated in this landmark action, which was removing homosexuality as a mental illness from the DSM. Um, so around this time in 1970, uh, we really see the birth of what we know as Pride now. Um, as Tony said before, uh, many of us know that in 1969, Stonewall happens, um, and there are days of protest in New York City that sort of spread nationally, um, and LGBTQ publications are writing about this event. Um, as well as mainstream publications, which sort of write about it in a problematic way, but still sort of expose it to the world. Um, and the following year, we see a, events across um, the country, particularly in major cities where you have these concentrations of queer people, um, where the Stonewall riots are being uh, commemorated. Um, so there are commemorative marches and what are called the Gayans that are organized in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles to coincide with the anniversary of Stonewall. Um, New York's march started with a small group of people, grew to hundreds and then to thousands as it entered Central Park. Um, the LA contingent of the first Pride uh, with the help of the ACLU, acquired a city permit and became the first LGBTQ march to be sanctioned by a city government. Um, so in the years following, the marches grew in size and participation. They spread across the world in small and large cities. Um, and now we often refer to this as the Pride Parade, which is an annual reminder of the Stonewall riots and sort of our resistance and fight for um, fundamental rights as a community. So then here, 
the community acts up these photos here of, of act up in the AIDS epidemic. Um, as many of you know, the first cases of what would later be called um, acquired immune deficiency syndrome were reported in 1981 by Dr. Michael Gottlieb from UCLA. Um, young men in three major United States cities were hospitalized with cases of extremely rare, deadly opportunistic infections. And within 15 years, AIDS would be the leading cause of death of um, Americans aged 25 to 44. Because the first reported cases of the disease were among gay men, public opinion pigeonholed um, this emerging epidemic as is the gay plague. The stigma of homosexuality remained strong in the 1980s, a decade that began with no federal or state anti-discrimination laws in place, to protect, this, to protect the civil rights of LGBTQ people. So as a result from 1981, from 1981 to 1982, the CDC spent only a million dollars on AIDS. By 82, 634 Americans had been stricken with AIDS and 260 were, were dead. Public opinion blamed those with AIDS for the disease. Life magazine proclaimed on its cover, no one is safe from AIDS. Violence against gay men rose precipitously with attackers increasingly taunting their victims with slurs about AIDS. In 1987, nearly 40,000 Americans had been diagnosed and over 20,000 had died. In that same year, Congress adopted an amendment banning funds for any AIDS education materials that promote or encourage directly or indirectly homosexual activities. This effectively outlawed any federally funded education efforts to limit the spread of the virus. Congress eventually approved the legislation in 1988 that would define comprehensive federal funding to fight uh, for AIDS treatment. So in this time, there were isolated process in 85 and 86, along with increasingly combative reporting in gay publications, indicating the mount mounting anger in the gay community. In 1987, at a CDC conference, a protest group calling itself the Lavender Hill Mob stormed the proceedings and shouted down the speakers. Avram Finkelstein's Silence Equals Death Collective spread posters throughout New York City to foment expanded gay activism. The AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, ACT UP, which formed later in the year in New York City, quickly became the face of new activism. A primary target of the group concentrated on non-availability of medications. Um, drugs identified as promising were not fast-tracked. The sole available drug was a failed cancer drug that made uh, folks sick when they took it. Using civil disobedience, direct action tactics, and media visibility, ACT UP put pressure on the FDA to expedite their work and made a an impression on um, uh, ACT UP made a lasting impression on other social justice movements moving forward. Great. And uh, the photos that you see here are from ACT UP um, Los Angeles. Uh, and one of those sort of uh, tactics that uh, Tony talked about, um, what were the die-ins that ACT UP activists did to sort of um, expose in a very visible way um, the experience of um, so many queer people uh, losing their lives to this uh, pandemic and government in action. Um, so you can see the poster on the left from ACT UP Los Angeles um, criticizing uh, Ronald Reagan, who was the president, as Tony talked about at this um, at the time of the really the start of the, the pandemic. Um, so in the following uh, decades, we see of a lot of attention paid to um, sort of movement for the freedom to marry. Um, and uh, the prohibition of same-sex marriage, as many of us know, and it sort of have lived through, um, had ramifications beyond the institution itself. Um, so same-sex partners of hospital patients could be denied visitation and decision-making power. Um, the death of a partner could leave the surviving partner without any of the benefits and rights granted to married couples. Um, 
notably in regards to taxes, insurance, housing, inheritance, child custody. Um, American citizens could not prevent their non-citizen same-sex partners from de being deported, uh, limited adoption and child custody rights. Um, so in many, many ways, uh, same-sex couples were denied the equal protection and due process of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, so in 1996, the Hawaii Supreme Court rules that states cannot legally deny same-sex couples marriage. Um, and then uh, Hawaii and 15 other states then enact laws prohibiting same-sex marriage, and the federal government passes the Defense of Marriage Act, um, which denies federal benefits um, for same-sex couples, um, even if the state legally recognized the union. Um, so in 2000, Vermont passes the nation's first civil union law. Um, in 2004, the Massachusetts State Supreme Court rules that banning gay marriage was unconstitutional, and it becomes the first state to officially recognize gay and lesbian uh, weddings. Um, and we see uh, 22 more states ban same-sex marriages, um, but we also see states begin to legalize same-sex marriage, uh, which leads us to Edie Windsor, who is here at the top right, um, and who actually provided funding to help us create some of these history uh, panels that we're using in this presentation, um, which I think is very interesting. Um, so in June 2013, uh, Edie Windsor wins a Supreme Court decision declaring um, DOMA unconstitutional. So essentially, the Supreme Court says that the federal government cannot um, deny uh, the same rights to uh, same-sex couples that are um, given to uh, opposite-sex couples. Um, so this provides precedent um, for the Supreme Court in 2015 to decide Obergefell versus Hodges, um, where the court held that the these bans also violated the 14th Amendment, um, guaranteeing that same-sex marriage is a fundamental right, um, and therefore invalidating all existing state bans. Um, and as, uh, as we know, um, last year, at the end of last year, uh, President Biden signed the Respect for Marriage Act into law, which essentially makes um, the Windsor ruling into federal law. Um, so now it is federal law to recognize same-sex uh, marriage, um, although it does not necessarily go as far as the Obergefell uh, ruling, which forces states to recognize those marriages. Um, all right. Now pride today. Um, so today, Pride, uh, as you all know, um, are celebrations in cities town and towns across the world. Um, there are, you know, parades and festivals that draw millions of participants, um, you know, initially controversial um, and even subjected to hostile crowds in smaller towns and cities in the first decades after Stonewall. Today, these celebrations um, benefit from extensive corporate sponsorship um, and support from politicians and celebrities. Um, you know, you, you can see how we've been talking about the history over the last, the, you know, decades since the 40s. Clearly, with each decade, um, uh, you know, activists, uh, movements grew. Over these years, there were large marches on Washington in 1979, in 1987, in 1993, 2000 and 2009, which collectively drew 2 million participants. Um, in those early marches, the media shut out coverage of those marches. Um, and uh, from in, in 79 and 87, um, and then of course started to cover them much more with the 93 march. Um, national holidays such as National Coming Out Day were established. Um, uh, which is celebrated on October 11th on the importance of coming out to H L um, to LGBTQ activism, which was founded by Rodney Wilson, a gay teacher in Missouri. Um, the day honors the empowerment of coming out to family, friends, co-workers, and to promote the simple truth that people are more likely to support equality when they know queer people. Um, 
other kinds of uh, commemorative uh, holidays or, or, or important days in the calendar also emerge, such as World AIDS Day, which is December 1st, to unite the fight, uh, to unite around the fight against HIV and comm commemorate those that we've lost to the epidemic. So clearly today there's economic clout and organizational skills in queer communities um, that discourage dis discriminatory policies um, toward um, employees. Um, and there's the Williams Institute, a national LGBTQ think tank that estimates that roughly 9 million Americans identify as queer um, and can be found in every walk of life and are visible in every culture and society of today. In 1991, the Victory Fund formed to assist openly queer politicians to gain office. 20 years later, its success is evident in hundreds of openly LGBTQ elected officials who serve and have served in all levels of government. Okay, so that sort of leads us to where we're at today. Um, and this, I think uh, something that Michael put in the, in his question, he said, are we in the best of time, the worst of times? I think this is a good um, summary of this slide. Um, so today, uh, the LGBTQ plus community, um, we are sort of making great progress um, and also experiencing immense challenges. Um, and you can sort of see that uh, laid out here just in these few sort of screenshots. Um, so in 2020, um, the Supreme Court ruled in a case involving uh, Amy Stevens, a transgender woman. Um, there was also a gay man involved in that case, but I cannot remember his name right now. Um, but those two uh, were discriminated against in employment because of their uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. And the Supreme Court ruled that employers cannot discriminate based on um, based on sexual orientation or uh, gender identity. Uh, so that was a very significant Supreme Court case. Um, and we also see many states that are sort of moving to ban conversion therapy for LGBTQ youth, um, which has sort of scientifically been proven to be harmful to uh, young people. Uh, we have more LGBTQ elected officials than ever before. Um, when I took, when I screenshot this like a couple of weeks ago, this was the number. So it may have even grown since then. Um, and uh, at the same time, we see uh, great challenges to our rights, um, many similar to experiences that our community has faced in the past. Um, I believe this number is in the 500s today, um, but the ACLU is tracking nearly 500 uh, anti-LGBTQ bills in the US. Um, those include bans on uh, healthcare for trans youth and many, many states. Um, some states that are moving to ban drag performances, um, which also impact uh, trans people's ability to express themselves the way they want in public. Uh, so recently in West Hollywood, there was a march um, against the, this type of legislation um, on Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, and states are uh, banning uh, LGBTQ history or discussions of gender identity or sexuality in schools. Um, similar to the kind of history that we've touched on today. Uh, but what is really inspiring to me is that, uh, particularly in Florida, there are students who are um, organizing walkouts in support of LGBTQ um, history and LGBTQ peers, and um, actually creating their own study groups to read books that are being banned, to study banned histories, um, creating social media content to cover these uh, topics that are being limited in their schools. Um, so we see, indeed, I think it's the best of time, worst of times. <laughs> um, and okay. then he's going to talk a little bit more about our work. Yeah, and let me just also just comment about the best of times, worst of times question, which is, um, you know, I, you are all students of history. Um, you know, we in the LGBT rights community, I've been doing this work for over three decades, and we see these cycles over and over again. And in fact, I think it's important to remember that in the late 1970s, there was Anita Bryant um, with her Save the Children campaign in Florida. Um, 
uh, you know, anti-gay Anita Bryant. There was a, the Briggs Initiative in in the early in the late seventies in California, trying to ban um, queer teachers from teaching in public schools. Um, and today we're seeing so these similar efforts. Um, back then, it was about recruiting, you know, children to a gay lifestyle. Today, it's about um, you know, gender ideology indoctrination is the language that the right is using these days. These are recycled um, attacks on the gay community. Um, and we have, you know, fought and won these battles before and we will again. We are, will remain ever vigilant, but I think it's a really important time for allies to really step up to come to those school board meetings um, you know, show up at these protests. Um, it's really a time to um, to strengthen the allyship with um, straight folks uh, to help in today's battles because um, it is alarming to see what's going on. But we know we've been through worse. Um, and when the battleground is in elementary school, I see that as progress. Um, so, you know, I'm always hopeful, but um, it is a really, really challenging time for LGBT people right now. Um, so I think there's no, no way of sugarcoating that. Um, so One Archives Foundation, this was, I think, my last, this is my last slide. Is that right? Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> so One Archives Foundation, uh, over all of these decades, um, has uh, been many things. We've had many iterations since our founding in 1952 as a magazine, as an educational institute. All the while, um, Jim Kepner was creating this, was building this archive, this collection of LGBT materials um, through the decades. And um, in the 90s, in 1994, the after one ink had already closed, the one institute also closed. What was left was the archive. And One Archives Foundation, we were in these years looking for a home for this collection, which was even at that point the largest collection of queer materials in the world. Um, we finally found a home in, in, in a large institution, the University of Southern California. The collection went to them actually in 2000, but we officially gifted the collection in 2010. And they now hold the collection and tend to that collection. Um, and it was at that time that One Archives Foundation um, sort of redefined itself as an organization which was growing and tending to this archive to one that is doing public programming to amplify um, the collection and also to do education and events around LGBTQ history. So that's what we do today. We do um, education programs, exhibitions, um, and other kinds of public events to tell queer and trans stories um, over time. And um, we are growing um, and we in fact are going to be hosting an important queer histories festival in the fall, which I hope that you will all, um, uh, you know, join our newsletter list so you can keep up with um, all the dozens of programs we're, we're going to be doing during LGBTQ History Month um, for this festival called Circa, and that's in celebration of 70 years that we've been around the oldest queer organization in the country. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that. Um, I just want to end by briefly talking about um, some of the work that we're doing now um, as a sort of public history arts education organization. Um, Tony actually talked a little bit about the Briggs Initiative um, in 1978, which sought to ban gay teachers from working in California schools, or in fact, anyone who's voiced any sort of support for uh, for LGBTQ people. Um, so here are two photos from our archive, one sort of in opposition to that proposition and one in support. Um, you can see the anti-gay um, sign that says preserve parents' rights to protect their children from teachers who are immoral and who promote a perverted lifestyle. Um, 
which unfortunately is pretty much the same language being used today. Um, and we have a really important role to play in this sort of, uh, in this fight. Um, at, as the education programs manager, um, I oversee programs to implement LGBTQ history in uh, local schools and across the state. Um, California is actually one of seven states that requires LGBTQ history in K through 12 um, schools. So that was passed in 2011. Um, that might kind of answer one of your questions, Michael, also. Um, and um, we have over 16 lesson plans on this history, some of the topics we talked about today that are available for teachers. Um, and we work directly with youth um, to give them opportunities to do research in our archives um, and produce their own passion, passion projects. Um, so we've had students create projects on queer film history, uh, queer love letters, um, on intersectionality, um, and those are some of our teachers in the top right who have participated in our teacher institutes. Um, so uh, this is some of the work that we are doing um, at the One Archives Foundation to preserve LGBTQ history and uh, hopefully in effect to sort of elevate our humanity and educate, especially young people about uh, what we've been through and equip them with tools to uh, engage in as as citizens today. All right. So thank you for um, sticking with us today in our presentation. Um, we have time for uh, questions. Um, and if you would like to support the work that we're doing, uh, this QR code will take you to um, our donation page. Um, in particular, in support of our education programs um, to continue to uh, educate the public and students about queer history. Um, so there's a link there and you can use the QR code and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Can I jump back in for a moment with a uh, question because it would take too long to type it. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I had actually had a, an extensive interview with um, uh, Joe Hawkins when he was executive director of the archives. And there were a couple of things that he pointed out to me that I'd like to get some expansion on if you, if you possibly can. It is slightly out of the time period you're talking about in this presentation. We're talking about the 1920s. Uh, the main, you, I guess you could say it was the mainstream acceptance of a female impersonator such as Julian Eltrich, who actually did have a sizable following and was actually quite, uh, you know, quite popular in vaudeville and in and, uh, and certainly in uh, in the New York theaters where, you know, he spent a lot of uh, you know a lot of time. And also, um, since since drag performances right now on you know on the on the forefront. Uh, there are so many cultures that actually have a tradition of, of uh, you know, of, 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 of impersonation, whether it's, you know, you know, male acting is female, female is male, that kind of thing. Um, in say Mexico, there is apparently a very active uh, uh, drag culture and this is something that, again, that uh, Joe Hawkins had mentioned to me at one point in time. And I kind of want to get a little bit of not so much information, but coming at this as a, you know, as a relatively uninformed white male, what would be useful for me to know about, uh, you know, about uh, drag culture? You know, since obviously there's been so much misinformation about it recently, is there a, is there a thumbnail that you can provide as to what is what you know what should i know about it 
Well, I think some things I can speak to uh, in regards to your question, certainly during the 30s and 40s, like especially in the 20s, actually, there are a lot of drag performers, like you mentioned, Julie and Atange. Um, but it's really during the 30s and 40s that it becomes to associated with homosexuality and with uh, perversion. So there becomes this sort of new um, crackdown on cross-dressing, especially when it is being done in um, queer spaces. Because um, even in World War II, there's a photo um, here. Let me go all the way back. Um, like servicemen would, um, on bases would get in drag and perform and it was considered acceptable. Um, and many of them were heterosexual, um, but it also allowed queer um, service members to sort of express that without it being known as a, a thing. Um, but actually going all the way back to the 1860s, the first known drag queen that we, um, that sort of a historian Channing Gerard Joseph discovered in the archives is someone named William Dorsey Swan, who was a formerly enslaved man that um, moved to Washington DC following emancipation to pursue economic opportunity. He organized this house called the House of Swan, which was primarily queer African-Americans. Um, and he was a drag performer. They called him the queen of the drag uh, or a drag queen. Um, and his House of Swan was actually raided by the police because he was violating cross-dressing laws. Um, and he uh, they resisted the police and he actually, he was arrested and he actually wrote a letter to Grover Cleveland uh, requesting a pardon, arguing that his freedom of expression was being violated um, and freedom of association, um, making him the first queer person to petition the government for the right to associate. Um, so there's actually this long history of sort of of drag uh, performance, especially its connection with like uh, civil rights. Um, and I think that just speaking about drag generally, it's an art form, right? It's a form of dress up. Um, it's sort of mocking larger society. Um, and just like any other art form, like dancing or singing or acting, um, it can take many different forms. It might be for adult audiences, or it might be for all ages, or it might be for children. Um, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a little bit of my thoughts on it. <laughs> I think that and I think that's exactly right, Trevor. I mean, you would know better than I because you uh, have done, you've been a drag queen and you're an excellent drag queen. I've seen you in our pictures. Um, and um, but I think that it's a that it's an art form um, and that uh, people often who are not familiar with that culture um, get confused about, um, you know, the sort of the spectrum of, of sort of transgender identities from, um, you know, from drag performers to folks who um, are looking to, um, you know, change the gender that they were born um, into. Um, that um, for drag queens, it's, it's an art form and it's a form of entertainment and it's female impersonation or male impersonation. Um, and as a super fan of, of RuPaul's Drag Race, <laughs> I would say watch some episodes of that show and um, you will learn so much about um, the lives of these um, incredible artists. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about RuPaul's Drag Race, not to go on a whole tangent about that, but uh, in many episodes, queens will talk about queer history and sort of the history of drag, which is honestly where I've learned so much. Um, and, but drag also gives, uh, particularly for trans people or people who have, um, who are non-binary, it is, it is an art form in a way of sort of expressing something, but it also allows people to um, contend with their own identity in ways that they might not otherwise be able to, which I think a lot of art does. Um, I would say it's similar to cosplay. You're putting on, some drag queens sort of think of themselves as putting on, um, as being themselves in a costume, and other drag queens see it as sort of a different persona, a way of expressing a different aspect of themselves. Um, 
I see a question about one archive at USC. Um, do you know if they're trying to add to their collection? Um, I'm sure, Tony, do you know that answer that question? If you're interested in um, oh, um, adding to the USC, the archives? Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the archive, uh, the, the answer is yes, but of certain kinds of, of, um, of collection. So, um, you know, archives like archives all over the world um, can be, uh, you know, places that document more dominant narratives, um, you know, white men or white people, um, cis people. I think that the One Archives Foundation is will always be working toward diversifying its collection and so is interested in queer and trans collections for marginalized folks. Um, but, you know, it is always looking to grow the collection. Now, I will say also, though, that um, there, there's so much in warehouses and storage that um, they do have, they can't just take anything, um, like in the old days. Um, we get requests uh, practically daily um, that go through us, but I have to send over to Joseph about um, folks wanting to collect things, but they have to be selective um, because the space isn't unlimited. So the answer is yes, it just depends on what it is that's going to be uh, potentially donated to that collection. Um, got another question up there from Adam too, the favorite. Uh, favorite queer history location. Tony, do you have a favorite queer history location in LA? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think one of them has to be West Hollywood, just because it is a neighborhood that um, is the most famous in Los Angeles for um, its support um, and even for its leadership um, by LGBTQ people. Um, but that isn't the only, you know, LGBTQ location in Los Angeles. But one definitely one of my favorites is one of, uh, you know, I think it's a place where a lot of LGBTQ people feel safe. Um, and uh, even though it can still be dangerous, and obviously we've seen in the news people getting attacked um, in West Hollywood. But um, I also, you know, I, I love places like the LGBTQ Center. I used to work in an LGBT center in San Diego, my first job out of college. So I've, there's a special place in my heart for those kinds of organizations. Um, but I think One Archives has to be one of my favorite queer history location. If you haven't visited the archives, it's under it's under um, renovation all year, much needed, needed renovations, but it will open up again in January. And I know, cause I've talked to Joseph and Lexi and Lonnie there at the archive, um, they will be reopening to the public and starting to schedule, um, you know, monthly tours. I highly recommend you come to one of those tours of the archives if you haven't. It's really an extraordinary collection and it's a real treasure here in Los Angeles. Um, let's see, there's another question about, Adam had another question where you, they said, Pride in New York City has Marsha P. Johnson. Does LA's queer liberation story have a lead hero you could tell us about? Um, well, someone that really stands out to me, and I don't know that has always been celebrated as a hero, but I think the work that Sir Lady Java did that we talked about was so significant um, because she was one of the first uh, people to really uh, take this fight to um, court. Um, and um, she not only, I think it's important to recognize not only was this law impacting performers, but it's just impacting people who um, would be considered cross-dressing in their daily lives. Um, so trans women in general, just for being in public. Um, so I'm glad that she's starting to get some recognition. There's a documentary that either recently came out or is coming out soon uh, about her. Um, and one of the actresses from Pose is playing her. Um, so I watched that. Tony, do you have a, um, someone else that comes to mind is Troy Perry of the Metropolitan Community Church. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's go to the next question because I can't, 
I'm like blanking because there are so many. <laughs> I don't want to sit here and um and hold and hold up. But there, you know, one of the things that actually is important about One Archives Foundation is that um for a long time the the history of the queer movement has been overshadowed by New York City and in San Francisco. And it is simply an, you know, because the queer history that's come out of Los Angeles, the significant events, um, organizations, and you know, and and um, and impact that this city has had on the global queer rights movement is massive, um, and it's still a story that's been untold, and that's part of what we do at One Archives Foundation. And I think that it's, you know starting to be more known um, outside of LA, but it is um, definitely one that's going to take some time for people to realize um, that um, LA has had in its own ways as large as an impact as any other place um, in the um, LGBT rights movements. A comment there from Nancy. I don't know if either of you want to know. Yeah, I agree with you, Nancy. I think that you know the 2024 election is um is definitely influencing a lot of these right-wing legislators. Um to you know pass these laws not just obviously not just against lgbtq people but against women against people of color um and so um yes and a lot of the lgbtq laws are purposely vague as they have been historically um to create sort of a chilling effect um, where, you know, people feel like in schools in Florida, for example, they feel like they're not sure what the law is, so they just won't say anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe these laws won't, um, won't uh, stick when they go through the court process, but, you know, I'm not sure about that. And so we're going to remain vigilant. Um, but you know some of them like this tennessee law which was struck down they're absurd what they're trying to you know prevent um you know folks from you know you could think that it could target women wearing pants you know um uh so as ridiculous as they are the world you know has is so unpredictable, I think, you know, especially since Trump, that we can't take anything for granted. Um, but yes, I do believe that a lot of these uh, measures, book bans, you know, curriculum bans in schools, they're just not going to hold up in time, over time. I start to wrap up, but I just had a question if there was any um, uh, events or, or any um, exhibitions or any screens or anything that, that you all recommend for uh for pride month or you know sort of upcoming weeks that uh people want to learn more or get involved we do have an exhibition at our we have a gallery called the one gallery in west hollywood it's on robertson um there's an exhibition all month on the um trans artist coyote park um who's this amazing um two-spirit uh trans artist, photographer. Um, it's uh, some of their photography that's up. Um, and there are gallery hours on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So I welcome you to um, come visit the gallery and, and check out their work for the month. Um, I know, Trevor, you have some things going on too. Um, on June 17th, um, at Will Rogers State Beach um, at 10 a.m., there will be, we will be doing an event with um, the county supervisor for our district, uh, Supervisor Lindsay Horvath, to commemorate the queer history of Ginger Rogers Beach. Um, so 
The lifeguard towers there are currently being painted rainbow and they're putting up interpretive historical signs. One of them I showed you today. Um, so that will certainly be a, a cool historical event. Um, and uh, if you're an educator or no educators, we have an educator social on June 28th um, at the One Gallery where the Cardi Park exhibition is. You can do two things at once. Um, those are two things I could think of. Uh, there's also a workshop at the Academy Museum on June 16th for youth on, uh, on drag, um, the history of drag, how to do drag that I will be doing with my friend Pickle the Drag Queen, um, who was just selected as West Hollywood's first drag laureate. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, but you can see our, if you go to our social media, it's one archives on basically everything. Um, you can see updates on our events. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you, both Tony and Trevor, for taking the time. And uh, I know I learned a lot and hopefully everyone else did. Um, it was really great. And um, yeah, if anyone uh, wants to learn more there, you can also... Uh, find the, the one archives online there.